Our precious Father, we want to thank you for the privilege we have again to study your word this evening. We trust you that you will teach us. We trust you that you open our eyes and help us to have understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are still on the things of the Spirit, part five, the things of the Spirit. And then we need to appeal to us that uh, it's very important as Christians that we grow spiritually. In Isaiah 28 verse 9, say, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And who shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. They're the ones that will have understanding and, and understand doctrine. You know, we can remain babies forever. Not understanding the things of the kingdom. Just traditional churchgoers. Orthodox churchgoers. Just coming to church and going. We just can't remain like that because it is to your own personal disadvantage anyway. Uh, look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 5.12. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk. Listen to this. is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe. He can't fight spiritual battles. He can't, can't have victory. He certainly can't even reach for his blessings in Christ. Because he doesn't even know them. He's unskilled in the word of righteousness. He has no skill at all in using the word of God to build his faith. No skill to use the sword of the spirit. And babies are other dependent and easily deceived. In Hebrews 6, 1-3, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ... Let us go on to perfection. Let's go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying of hands, of resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. This we will do if God promises. Paul is talking about people who are stuck in Judaism. Christians who are stuck in the laws of Moses, they will not move on to grace. They won't move on to the New Testament. You're teaching the New Testament they are living in dead works. Because they think that those dead works which they are, will produce their self-righteousness is what God is desiring. The Bible says if righteousness comes right by the law, then Jesus died in vain. He died in vain. Such people think that you know they are being holy and good. They will impress God and, and, and then part of qualify for God to now bless them. But they have forgotten. They have forgotten that all, if you want to see the glory of God, Jesus said only believe is by faith in what he has done for you. They have forgotten that without faith it's impossible to please God. And faith in Christ is what we're talking about. And so Paul is saying we should, we should come off that kind of mindset and come to the New Testament, in, in, to, 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 to the era of grace, era of the cross and the benefits of the cross. You know? So these people who are stuck in the Old Testament, Paul was pleading with them that you should grow. You shouldn't go back to the first principles of you know, being saved by grace, the basic things of Christianity. They should move on. There's other things that you should be able to understand and live by so that your usefulness in the kingdom is maximized. Besides, if we don't grow spiritually, it affects us. We backslide easily. Under pressure, we backslide easily because we don't even understand what's going on. We blame God, we blame the pastor, we blame the church, and we backslide to hell, just backslide to the devil. And it gets really worse because we are not grounded in this thing, we are not growing. So, and where we need to be now, right now, is the, the things of the Holy Spirit. We need to be people who understand the things of the Holy Spirit, the acts of the Holy Spirit. That's where we need to be now. In our growth and understanding in all of this and yielding to the Holy Spirit, that will testify to what He is using us to do in these last days uh, by all these manifestations we're discussing. We ought to be there now. We should be able to understand the things of the Holy Spirit. I understand there are some people, some of these teachings may be like Greek to them. But we should know them. 
The scripture says we shouldn't be ignorant of them. We can't be scrolling around, you know, being told the same thing. You are saved by grace. You are saved by grace. Leave the law alone. We should be in the, the, this is the era of the Holy Spirit. So a Christian must be familiar with the things that the Holy Spirit is doing. So that it's not even deceived by the devil. You know, and it's in doing, in understanding what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, in the church, with other people, that you benefit from it. You yield to it. You accept it. And then you yourself, you yield to the Holy Spirit using you. And when the Holy Spirit starts using you, you become a proof, a proof producer that Jesus is alive. You become a real witness of Jesus Christ. Look at what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 4, 18. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly. If the Lord will, and I will know. Paul, what will you know? Not the words of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not just word, but in power. I want to see what the Holy Spirit is doing through them. Because this is, this is what it's all about. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit. In demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, a proof by the Spirit and power of God, operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions and thus persuading them, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, human philosophy, but in the power of God. So the Christian should be a vessel in the hand of the Holy Spirit to do powerful things, to do things, to demonstrate the kingdom of God. It's not just for pastors, it's for every Christian. But if you don't know them, you will not be able. Look at the, the early church. They understood, Paul taught them well, Paul and Apollos. They understood these things. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul said, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, had a doctrine, had a tongue, had a revelation, had an interpretation. Let all things be done until you define. So if, if people came to church being used by the Holy Spirit to bless the whole body. They were not coming for the pastor to pray for them, lay hands on them, and do all those kind of things. They have, they have, over, they have become matured, and mature people take responsibility. Babies don't take responsibilities. They want somebody to change their diaper, feed them a, you know, a bottle, and if you don't visit them, they are crying in their homes. They are crying in their homes. Oh, they think they are coming to church is doing God a favor. They are totally ignorant. They don't know anything. They need God more than God needs them. And so these people, they come to church, they, they, the Spirit of God is using the whole body. The whole body, that's what the church is, a body. God is using the whole body. Everybody is contributing. And why? First Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12.1 And concerning spiritual things, brethren, I do not wish you to be ignorant. So he taught them. So they were not ignorant. They had grown. So they were able to, they were able to yield to the Holy Spirit. They understood these gifts of the Holy Spirit. They understood how it works. So they were yielding to it. The Spirit was using them. And you could see the result in the early church. You could see the result in the early church. Now last week we were studying the inspirational gifts. The vocal gifts. The inspirational gifts. The vocal gifts. The gifts that make you say something. We said there are inspirational gifts. And this is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the sign of spirits. And to another, diverse tongues, kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. So these, these uh, vocal gifts, inspirational gifts, they're inspirational because they just do three things mainly. They defy, exalt, and comfort. There's no revelation that comes through them. It's just purely, just merely inspiration. No revelation at all. So there are prophecy, diverse kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So let's, let's, let me remind us some things, because this thing called prophecy have been misused, misinterpreted, and abused. So I need to, I need to emphasize some things I said before. Uh, the, the gift of prophecy is an inspired supernatural utterance that aims at three things. At three things. Brethren, at three things. There's no revelation in it. There is no telling the future in the simple gift of prophecy. None. None at all. It will shock a lot of people because it has been misused. Anything is prophecy. Anybody talks is prophecy. It's not true. The Bible is not confused. God is not confused. He defined these things for us in the Bible. But we don't study the scripture. And the Bible says we should study. So we rightly divide the world. We don't. So we flow with the ignorant crowd. 
So in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, but he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. We explain what edification means. is to build them up in knowledge. Some people think he's teaching. No, it's not teaching. Teaching is what you prepare and teach precept upon precept. Yes, it can build people up in knowledge. But this is a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit that comes on you and you begin to bring supernatural utterance. You didn't prepare it. It didn't come from your mind. It didn't come. You can, can say things that is beyond you. you but it brings, it, bring, it, it builds the Christian up in his understanding of the things of God, in his understanding and knowledge of Christ. That's called edification, like you're building an edifice. It brings, the, it brings knowledge. Then exhortation is, is something that makes people do something. You make them draw closer to Christ. You make them study more. You to make them pray more. You study, make them fellowship more. And the focus of all this is Christ. The Bible says that the spirit of prophecy is Jesus Christ. It's the spirit of Christ. That's what it is all about. So, and then the, the comfort is to re- reduce stress. You speak to people to reduce stress that challenges brings to them. So this is what the simple gift of prophecy does. And then we said that you have the simple gift of prophecy does not mean you are a prophet. You are not a prophet because you have a simple gift of prophecy. For reasons because every, the, Paul said every Christian should seek to prophesy because he brings edification, he brings exhortation, he brings comfort. And the church needs this thing. So there's no, we, can't, we can't have enough. So he said, we are, every Christian should be able to, to desire to prophesy. But he said, every Christian is not designed to be a prophet. Because the office of the prophet is like being a pastor, like being a, an evangelist, like being an apostle. There are five offices like that. They are called ministry offices. And the Paul said, God set some in the church to be pastors, to be this, to be this. But the simple gift of prophecy Everybody in the church can convert it and, and do that and, and they manifest that. So, and then there are other differences we mentioned, but I'm not going to go into all that details. Just to remind us, you can go back to what we did last time. Now, let's go straight to our teaching today. We're talking about uh, uh, the diverse tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Diverse tongues. Diverse tongues. First Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to even to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, the word of the to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another the faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the, the gifts of healing. Plural. I explain this thing. Plural. Because nobody has all the gifts of healing. Your, your gifting in healing can be on cancer, and the other one can be on pain. The other, so nobody has all of it. So that's why it's called gifts, it's plural, gifts of healing by the same spirit, verse 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. So we're talking about diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Let's see where we get to today, and wherever we stop, the next week we continue. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, and God has set some, again in the church, you see, not everybody can do this one, has set some in the church. First apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps government diversities of tongues. So you see now, we're seeing that there is this one that is the gift of um, tongues that everybody can have. Then there's this one that God has set some in the church who can manifest these diversities of tongues. So there is this, the, the gift of tongue is called diverse, uh, diverse kind of tongues because it's, it's plural in manifestation. Like the gift of, gifts of healings is plural in manifestation. In the same way, these are the two gifts that are plural in manifestation. The gift of diverse tongues is plural because it's diverse tongues, diverse tongues. So we're going to try and explain it, number one, is the, the, the diverse tongues, why is it uh, diverse tongues? Why is it diverse tongues? Let me even, interp- let me even give you the definition of diverse tongues and then uh, interpretation of tongues. 
Now let's start. A prophecy is supernatural utterance in a known tongue. I've started from prophecy so you can understand it better. Prophecy is supernatural utterance in a known tongue. Diverse tongues or diverse kinds of tongue is supernatural utterance in an unknown tongue. Prophecy and tongues do the same. They defy. They, they defy. They, they, you will see it in scripture. They do the same. So prophecy will bring edification, exhortation in a known tongue. But diverse tongues will bring edification in an unknown tongue. Then the interpretation of tongues is the supernatural showing forth by the Holy Spirit the meaning of an utterance in other tongues. So the, the interpretation of tongues makes the diverse tongues uh, useful because without that interpretation, nobody knows what you're talking about. So if you bring a message, simple gifts of prophecy and bring the edification in no language, it doesn't need interpretation. But you can bring the same, you can, you can bring this same, the same message in tongues, maybe not exactly the same, but the manifestation of this that brings edification in tongues. And the interpretation of uh, prophecy makes it known to people, then they get the edification of it. So that's, you see, these three, these three manifestations are vocal gifts that are simple inspiration gifts. So diverse kind of tongues is supernatural utterance in an unknown tongue. It is a supernatural utterance by, by the Holy Spirit in languages never learned by the speaker nor understood by the speaker. Never learned by the speaker. So it doesn't come by learning it by intellect. No. It's a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Speak through your spirit. The Holy Spirit directly speaking through your spirit. In the language you never learned, language you don't even understand, and they even may not even be understood by the hearer, but that's why you need interpretation. Now, the, the, there are two manifestations of these gifts. That's why it is diverse kinds of talk, tongues. Number one is the non-public ministry manifestation of tongues which every believer has, can have, at baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is private use of tongues. It's not to minister to people. It's not to minister in the church. This is for you alone. So every believer can have it when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, there's the second one, which is the ministry gift of tongues to some believers to use in public ministry. That's why now, when you use it in public ministry, you now need an interpreter so that people sitting in church will understand the message given to them. So you see, diverse tongues. This one is for private use. This one is for public use. So we're going to see, understand them as we go on further. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, we see, we see it, and God has said some in the church. So in this, in this one of public ministry, not everybody can do that. Because Paul said, God has said some, some in the church. First apostles, secondary prophet, thirdly teachers. After that, the miracles, then the gifts of healing. So not everybody has the gift of healings now or helps governments. Not everybody has. So you say diversities of tongues. So not everybody has it except those that God has set in, in the church. Set them in the church. Why? Because they are going to be ministering to the church in this manifestation of diverse tongues. Now let's go to the first one, the private use of tongues, the private use. This is the gift of tongues a believer receives when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every, every believer should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every believer should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so every believer should speak in tongues in this private use of tongues. Every believer should. And besides, it's a sign that follow believers. And if it's a sign that follow believers, then he follow them then. Then we follow believers now until Jesus comes. So every believer should speak in tongues. Every believer should speak in tongues. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out them devils. Every believer should be able to do this now. And they shall speak with other tongues. Every believer should also do this one. They shall take off serpents, and even if they drink any daily thing, it shall not hurt them. This is for, not for some believers. Every believer. Then they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is for every believer. So, when you get back to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, it's for every believer, because it's a science that follow believers. 
and it's all, all these things are supernatural manifestation. There is none that is natural realm thing. All of them are the works that the Holy Spirit does. So we're trying to show that every believer ought to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Because it's a tongue that follows. It's a um, sign that follows you. Just like every believer should lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And every believer should be able to, in the name of Jesus, cast out devils. So all these signs follow believers. He follow them then. He's following us now. We follow us until Jesus comes. That's number one point. So every believer should be able to speak in tongues. Number two is that this, the purpose of this private use of tongue, while we're speaking in tongue, is a devotional gift mainly to be used in prayer. So if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you are not praying in the Spirit, you are missing one of the purposes for which you are baptized. You are missing it out. It is a devotional gift, mainly a devotional gift. Not all of it, but mainly a devotional gift to be used in prayer. First Corinthians 14, 2. I mean, I'm talking of the private use of tongues. Not for the one to the minister to the church, no. First Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. You see, he's praying, he's talking unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Speaketh mysteries. And then verse 3, uh, and then let's go to First Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, by spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, praise. But my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps nobody. So you see, the, 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 being baptized in the Holy Spirit and you can speak in tongues now, gives you a, 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 a tool for prayer that is far superior than anything you can do. Because the Holy Spirit is praying with your spirit. And so, so if you're not praying in the spirit quite a lot, you are missing one of the purposes of that. Now remember, let me make a point here. Please, I want you to listen to me. Tongues is not for speaking to Satan. You can't confront satanic activity and you're speaking in tongues. You're wasting your time. There's no verse, no chapter, no verse in the Bible that says when you speak in tongues, you're speaking to Satan or even to man in private capacity, in private use. But you are speaking to God. We just got to reading that. So if you, if you see devils attacking you, sickness attacking you, instead of you rebuking them and you're speaking in tongues, you get no result, really. Because you should, you should attack the demonic spirit the way Jesus said to do it. He said, in my name, you shall cast them out. When you speak in tongues, you are not speaking to Satan. Neither are you speaking to a man. You're speaking to God. That's what, because that's the Holy Spirit speaking. And the Holy Spirit says, yeah, when I speak through you, I'm going to be speaking to God, not to the, to the devil. So you don't use that now to confront Satan. Let me show us an example of how the Bible says the Christians should confront satanic situations. Acts 16, 18. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said unto to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Paul didn't stay there speaking in the Spirit. No, 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 no. He spoke to that spirit in the name of Jesus and commanded that spirit to get up because you are the one doing the thing. You are the one that God has commissioned to use the name of Jesus to kick the thing out. <clears throat> so you stand and kick it out. So a lot of times people lose battles because they, are, they don't understand. So they are speaking in tongues in a situation where they, can, they should lift up the name of Jesus and knock out the thing. Knock it out. Immediately knock it out. And declare victory. So I just wanted to point this one out. Now, by praying in tongues, we bypass all human limitations. You bypass all human limitations, all of it. When you pray in tongues, you pray the perfect will of God. See why we're giving this thing. We pray the perfect will of God. Because the Holy Spirit knows the perfect will of God and is the one praying through you. Look at Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our limitations. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. It didn't say we don't know. It said we don't know how we ought to. It, said, it didn't say we said. It said for we know not as we ought to know. So our knowledge of how to pray is imperfect. That's what he's saying here. But the Spirit is said, make it intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit prays through your spirit on your behalf. 
He's helping you out because he knows the mind of God on, on any issue that you want to pray about. And so you see why we are baptizing the Holy Spirit and we are giving this, this gift of tongue to every believer. It's to use in prayer to bypass our limitations. All our limitations. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. See, you are not speaking to men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. You see, these mysteries, you don't know them. That's why you don't understand what you're saying, though. But you don't know these mysteries, but they are, they are really they are important to, to your situation. But the Holy Spirit knows them. So I, 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 I like a young literal translation. He said, in the Spirit, he does speak secrets that human mind cannot articulate. So you see that praying in the Spirit is very important. You see why every Christian should be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Because it's something you use for prayer. And then it's a perfect way to give thanks and praise God too. Acts 10, 45. And day of the circumcision, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. 46. For they had them speak with tongues and magnify God. They had them speak with tongues and magnify God. They say, wow, these people are baptized. Magnifying God in tongues will be the best thing you can do. Can be, there's no better way. You can't, nobody can pray better than the Holy Spirit. And look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. You see? And I will sing with my understanding also. Else... When thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupy the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? Seeing he understood not what thou said. Look at verse 17. For thou verily givest thanks well. So what you are doing is correct. It's well. But the other is not edified. We will discuss this particular point later on. So you see, Paul is not saying you shouldn't, you shouldn't Pray in spirit in church. No, he's not saying that. He's just illustrating that the importance of interpretation, though. You know, so, but he said, but if you pray in the spirit, if you sing in the spirit, he said, you give thanks well. He's not saying it's not good. He says it's good. You give thanks well. You give thanks well. You say you give thanks well. That's what he's saying. You give thanks well. So it is important that we know this. Ephesians 6 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So Paul is encouraging us to pray always in the spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit. God gave us this privilege. We should use it. Or what does it mean to pray in the spirit? Look at Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer. Sorry. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. So you see what Paul means by praying in the spirit. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So when Paul is saying praying in the spirit, he says praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit is praying in tongues. In the spirit he speaks mysteries. So Paul is urging us to pray in the spirit. There's a lot of benefit to that. A lot of benefit to this gift of tongue that we receive. Now, let me, let me uh, give you some more benefits to that. Number, another one is speaking in tongues for personal use is to edify yourself. It's for personal edification. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. I, I, I personally, in my own personal experience, is that when I pray a lot in this week, I get revelation. I get revelation from scriptures, revelation. I'm telling you, I get a lot of revelation. And when I'm done, I start writing them down. Most of the things I teach, I, I get from praying the Spirit. Most of it. I don't, con- I, don't con- I don't go to commentaries. I don't go to all of those things. I just trust the Spirit of God to tell me what he wrote. And I found out when I speak in the Spirit, I get edified. Edification is that you get knowledge. Review- revelations come. I'm not kidding you. Revelations come. They do come. So you edify yourself. But he that prophesied edified the church. 
You see, they all bring edification. <laughs> That's what they all do. In Jude 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Building up yourself. Edification is like building an edifice. Building up your faith. Building, how do you build up your faith? Is it not true revelation that you build up your faith? The Second Timothy 1, six. This is why I remind you to find into flames the spiritual gifts God gave you when I laid hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, a lot of people are not praying the spirit. They are fearful. They are fearful. But Paul is saying, you should find it into flame. You should start it up. You should pray. He said, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. This is not from God. He said, I told you, find it. you got this thing. Find it into flame. Find it. I personally believe that this is baptism of the Holy Spirit for Timothy. I don't have chapter and verse for that, so I'm not teaching it as a doctrine. But that's my, what I personally believe. So he's telling him, find it into flame. I lay hands on you. You got this gift. Find it into flame. Quick means use it. Use it. And when you use it, when the Holy Spirit is praying through your spirit, it starts, I mean, it, it, it starts your spirit. It rubs up on your spirit. Your spirit, the Holy Spirit walking through your spirit, does something special to your spirit, man. You know, so we should really find it into flame and pray a lot in the spirit. It is the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Praying the Spirit is the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's the gateway to the supernatural, somebody said, which is true. Because that's the first sign that you have received a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit from God. That's the first one. And that opens up other gifts to you. You also brought other gifts to you. So praying in the Spirit is, is the initial evidence of being baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit. Look at apostles themselves. Acts 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was come, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and they filled all the house where they were sitting. And there, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and they sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The first, the first one we saw was that they, they, immediately they were filled, they began to speak. They began, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. The Holy Spirit was speaking through their spirit. They began to speak. So that's, that's the standard everybody should see. That's the first one. So you can't, you can't duplicate something different from the first one. But let us see the other ones, the Gentiles, the Gentiles Acts 10 verse 44. While Peter yet spoke, spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. Who had the word? And they were, and I want you to notice how the battle of the Holy Spirit comes on people. This one comes without anybody. The first one without anybody. Now, this one without anybody. Acts 10 44. While Peter yet spake this was, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them, which had the word, and they of the circumcision were, were which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. How did they know? Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They heard them speak with tongues. So they know that's the evidence that these people have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me make a point here, please. There is nothing like being filled with the Holy Spirit, baptizing today, and then after one month you, you say you get, you get a <laughs> baptism of tongues. So it's, it's wrong. There's no chapter, there's no verse that teaches that. There's no chapter, there is no verse that teaches that. Unfortunately for the church, many people who teach churches, even big organizations, are no more Bible followers. There are no more Bible followers. I'm telling you people, there are no more following. They don't even believe the Bible anymore. The Bible is no more the authority they have. They talk of uh, relative truth. How can God's word be relative truth? God's word is the truth. Jesus is the truth. There's no relativity here. So they make, they make room for manipulating the word of God to suit their own ignorance and their own inability to experience these things. Because they don't experience it, they think then it mustn't be this. And because they have big titles and things, everybody that under the influence say, yeah, who said it, they say that's, that he's, he's so, so, so. 
He's a general superintendent. He's whatever name. Who cares about those names? Paul said, I don't care, I don't care about people's names. All those people that think they matter. Paul said, I don't care about it. We should come to the Bible. Let the Bible teach us. Let the Bible guide you. Anybody that they exhaust himself above the word of God, I am begging you, don't follow them. You will suffer the same consequences like them. You will. Efficient believers, Acts 19, from verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through Upper Coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? See, they, have, they are believers. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Verse 3. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6. See how they got baptized of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, that's why I said that Paul laid his hands upon Timothy. And personally, I think that is for baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. You see, the gateway. They spoke with tongues. Each, every time you see that, the first thing the Spirit will say is that they spoke with tongues, and then this other gift came. So you see, that speaking in tongues is the gateway to these other ones. He, don't, he didn't say, and they prophesied and spoke in tongues. No, it's always, and they spoke in tongues, and prophesied. They spoke in tongues, and magnified God. So they had them. Now Samaria, this is a misbreed of Jews and non-Jews. Acts 8, 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as, he, as yet he had not fallen upon none of them. He had Fallen, as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you see, baptism of the Holy Spirit is for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 17. Then they laid hands on them. This one way it is done. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. So how did Simon know? He must have seen something. He must have seen something that said, wow, these people have this thing that is awesome. He must have seen something. And we know that it is uh, speaking in tongues that uh, he saw. So we see that the Holy Spirit comes when people lay hands on you. He can come on you if you, if you, if you believe that the Holy Spirit has, been, has come. I receive without anybody. I just began to thank God that the Holy Spirit is here. And I said, Lord, I am good. I'm, you sent him. And now the baptism is my right. I said, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I began to thank God as I speak to speak in tongues. And immediately I began to speak in tongues. In my bedroom, nobody did it for me. Because I studied the Bible. I realized that, wow, the Holy Spirit is a gift too. All this is a gift. You don't pay for them. You don't carry for them. You don't fast for them. They're all gifts. The same way you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of them. It's called gifts. It's called gift. So we should understand all of that. Now, the second thing I want us to look at is the second manifestation of tongues to the believer is the gift of ministering in tongues and giving message in tongues and, interp interp and, and interpreting the message in the church, in public ministry. Again, people have misunderstood some of these things. We are going to talk about them now. The gift of diverse tongues. of the, what, what we discussed First, is the speaking in tongues that every Christian should have so that you use it as a, for prayer, personally for prayer, and to defy yourself. Now, this second one is what Paul said, God has set in the church some with this gift to minister to the church. The other one is not to minister to the church, it's for your person to minister to you. And I said, it is mainly devotional. So if you are not praying in tongues, you are missing the purpose for which you are baptized in the Holy Spirit to start. 
It's mainly devotional. Now, this second one is not mainly devotional. It's to minister to the church. Because the gift of prophecy is the same as the diverse gifts of tongues and interpretation. Because they do the same thing. The prophet speaks, the, the, if you speak to, to, uh, in tongues, you are speaking to men unto edification. That's in church. You are not speaking to men. The other one says, when, when you pray in tongues, you are speaking to God. You are not speaking to men. Now you are speaking to men. Now, prophecy says, when you prophesy, you are speaking to men to edify them. But when you give the message in tongues and interpret it, you are also speaking to men to edify them. So, prophecy is equal to gift of uh, 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 tongues plus interpretation. Once there's interpretation, the gift of prophecy is equal to the uh, gifts, uh, uh, gifts of tongues and interpretation. But while there's no interpreter, that's why Paul said that the prophecy is not greater because there's no interpreter, because people don't benefit unless there's an interpreter. But let's see what the, what the scripture says about this wonderful gift of uh, giving messages in tongue uh, that God gives to believers for the benefit of the church. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. See, so not everybody has the gift of interpretation of tongues, and not everybody has the gift of giving message in tongues. Now, people read it, they say, you see, that Paul said, oh, everybody should not speak in tongues. It's not true. Paul didn't say that. He's only saying that this gift of ministering to the body with the gift of interpretation, is given to some people. It's, it's ministry gift to the church. Not, the, not the, the, the speaking in tongues that every individual Christian should have for prayer. No, this is ministering to the church. Not everybody can give interpretation. And so not everybody can give message to the church in tongues. Giving message to the t- tongues in tongues Tongues in church and interpreting go hand in hand. They make it full. They make it full and it brings the same edification as the gift of prophecy. That's why these three gifts are called inspiration, inspirational gifts because they inspire you. They inspire you. They simply inspire you. Now, they, they, so, so some people have said, oh, Paul is saying, you know, not everybody should speak. It's not true. It's not true at all. Absolutely not true. Now, let's look at uh, some other scriptures and see whether Paul is saying we should not speak in tongues. Remember even in this verse 1 Corinthians, Paul says we should not prohibit people from speaking in tongues and we should not look down on prophets. He said we should not pro- don't stop people from speaking in tongues. That's what he said. Now, let, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5. He begins to address the importance of interpreting the gifts of tongues so as to make it meaningful to the people who are listening. I would that you all spoke, speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. He says, see, he wishes everybody to speak in tongues. And okay, rather but you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret. If he doesn't interpret, nobody understands him. So Paul said, it's bre- it's, the, pro- the one that gave prophecy is greater. But if there's interpretation, it's equal. Except interpret that the church, you see, now he's talking to the church. Remember the first one we, start, we, we read? He that speaketh in another tongue is speaking to God and not to men. Now he's speaking to men, to the church. This is the ministry gift of giving message to the church. This is not the one for prayer where you speak to God. This is giving message to the church church. That's what Paul said. Not everybody can is gifted in that area. Now, he says, if, let me go back to verse 5. I would that all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speak with tongues, except it interpret that the church when interpret, what happens? That the church may receive a defying. So these are inspirational gifts. The three of them. They receive a defined verse six. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you without interpreter? That's what he's saying. Except I shall speak to you uh, either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine, and even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in sounds, 
How shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if, I, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise he, except you utter by the tongue, was easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken now? For you shall speak into the air. Nobody will understand you. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world. None of them is without signification. Verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be unto me, and shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, listen to this. Seek that you may excel in a defined church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in tongue pray that he may interpret so that the church will know what the message given. That's all he's saying. That's all he's saying here. Illustrating it with, you can give him, and, 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 if, you, if, you, if you give a, a, a noise that nobody understands the significance, nobody will respond to it. So that's what he's saying here. For as much as you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church, inspiring the church. Wherefore then, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue, pray that he may interpret. Now Paul makes a distinction between the private use of tongues, which we talked to the first one, and then the public use of tongues, which we are talking about now. First Corinthians 14, 12. Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous for spiritual gifts, Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in unknown tongue pray that he may, he may interpret. 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayed, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with my spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. And then let's go to. Um, okay, let me continue. I pray with my understanding also. As when thou shalt bless with the spirit. How shall he that occupy the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? Seeing he understandeth not what thou said. All he's saying is about people not being able to understand you when you are speaking to, to, the, to people in tongues. Even if you are praying and then for them to follow you, he said they won't even understand when you are done, to even to say amen. So, but let's continue now. Let's continue in verse, uh, verse 17. For thou givest thanks well, but the order is not a device. Verse 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. You see, he's talking about his private use of tongues. He said, I use it a lot. That's why he was encouraging the church, praying the spirit always. He said, I, 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 pray, I speak in tongues more than all of you. So he's encouraging Christians, praying the spirit always, praying the spirit always. And then, verse 9, he begins to talk about the public use of tongues in ministry, verse 9. Yet in the church, I pray in the spirit more than all of you. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. What's he saying? He's saying, if, if I come to church and I give you a message in tongues, and nobody understands the worst of the use. So it is better for me to even speak only five words that you understand than 10,000 words in a known tongue, which nobody understands. In, verse, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. Can you give me 1 Corinthians 14, verse 10? Let me see. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 10. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you had a psalm, had a doctrine, had a tongue, had a tongue, had a tongue, had a tongue, had a revelation, had an interpretation. Let all things be done in unto a defiant. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, now he's talking to the church. Any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most three, and that by cause, and let one interpret. This is public use of tongues. This is diverse, this is diverse tongues, because there's tongues for private use, personal, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. The gift of tongues is yours. You've got to speak in tongues, because you're using it for prayer. 
Now, there are some who have this gift to be able to give message that they defy the church in tongues. And then some people are gifted in interpreting it so that the church will be edified. But there are others who have this gift of simple prophecy. They bring message that they defy the church in known language. These people bring message that they defy the church in unknown language and the interpreter makes it known. He makes it known. So Paul is saying, if any man speak in an unknown language, let it be by two. He didn't say they shouldn't speak. He didn't say they shouldn't speak. Oh no, that's, he didn't say they should. He said, if any man speak in an unknown language, let it, by, let it be by two, or at the most by three, that by, and that by cause, and let one interpret. Let one interpret. Why? So that the church will know what you're saying. Verse 28. But if there is no interpreter, then let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Do the private one. Speak to yourself and to God. Use your private tongue. Don't give us message. You can pray, to, you can be doing your private prayer to God and speaking to yourself, but not to the church. Do your private one. Let him speak to himself and to God in tongues. Sure. Because it's not talking to you. It's not ministering to the church. But if you want to minister to the church in tongues, there must be an interpreter. Otherwise, it doesn't, the, the whole thing is defeated. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Paul is saying. You know, so the, the, um, the interpretation of tongues is really the, the, the least of them because it depends on uh, the, the, the gift of tongues. If there's no gift of tongue, <laughs> there's no interpreter. No. There's no interpretation. So it's a simple one. It just simply depends on the gift of tongues. So 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone to profit with all. For to one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom, the other the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit. Ten. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the sign of spirit. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So there's somebody that has the interpretation of tongues. A gift of, not everybody can have it. This interpretation of tongues, like I said, is the supernatural showing forth by the Holy Spirit, the meaning of an utterance in tongues. So once there's an utterance in tongue, then the person who has the gift of interpreting it makes makes it meaningful to hear us, to the church. So it's a, it's a public ministry gift too. But all it does is to make meaning of the gift of the message in, uh, in tongues. So therefore, the purpose of this, this one particular gift is to render the gift of tongues understandable to the hearers so that the whole church and the one who gave the utterance in tongues may know what has been said in tongues. First Corinthians 12, verse 28. And God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondly, prophets, we read it. Then verse, uh, verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, and then do all interpret. So not everybody can do this one. Just like not everybody can give message in tongues. So not everybody can give interpretation in tongues. But every Christian, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can, be, you can speak in tongues for your private use. Mostly devotional use. Mostly devotional use. So this is not confusing at all. It is totally out there. So there's nowhere Paul said we shouldn't speak in tongues in church. He's talking that if you want to give message in tongues, there should be an interpreter. Or else you can speak to God and to yourself. So you, can, you can pray in tongues to yourself. You're not bothering anybody. You're not bothering anybody. You speak, you speak to God and to yourself in church, in church, in church. That's what he wrote. So people who say, you see, you don't, you, don't give message, you don't speak in tongues in church because what Paul, they didn't get what Paul is talking about. Now it's so clear what he's talking about. It's so clear what he's talking about. My prayer is that God will help us to understand so that we begin to yield ourselves to this wonderful gift. And now you know the purpose of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, receiving the gift of tongues. You should be able to pray in the Spirit all the time. That's what the Holy Spirit said. Praying in the Spirit always. With all supplication. With all, again, don't use it to speak to the devil. Because you are not speaking to the devil. You are speaking to God. You are speaking to God. And then you are defying yourself. 
By the grace of God, next week we might touch about a few things here and we'll move on to the other set of three gifts. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for teaching us the usefulness of the gifts you have given us so that we don't let it lay there and we miss out on the benefits that should have accrued to us and others if we yield to your spirit and become very useful members of the, of the kingdom of God, of the body of Christ. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also visit our YouTube page to live stream our sermons or to catch up on sermons you may have missed. On Sundays, service starts at 10.30 a.m. Due to the new procedures that have been implemented upon entering the church, those attending in-person service should arrive at 10 a.m. If you have any questions on any of our teachings, kindly email your questions to pro at ftlw.org. You can also log on to our website, look for the chat icon at the bottom right of our website, click and post any questions on our teachings that you may have, and they will be addressed at the earliest opportunity. Please note that only questions on our teachings can be submitted, and names are not required. On behalf of the Fountain of the Living Word Church, thank you and enjoy the rest of your week. Let's pray. Let me pray over the offering. Father, I want to thank you for your children that are giving to us the work of the Lord. Thank you, Father, because we bring all these things to serve you, to show love. We are simply, Lord, uh, you gave us, everything you gave us in this world is from you. We are stewards of what you gave us. We are bringing them, Lord, to you because you own everything. Receive the gifts of your children. As you promise us in the Bible, Lord, bless them according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let me dismiss us with this benediction. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Surely now, surely his goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen.